in the National Gallery looking at one of the great early 19th century paintings in their collection, Caspar David Friedrich's Winter Landscape, probably painted around 1811. Nicholas Marston, wh why have you brought me here to this painting in connection with uh, Schubert's music and landscape? Well, the simple answer to that, Tom, is that it is the only Caspar David Friedrich painting uh, in a public collection, uh, certainly in London, as far as I know. Uh, but as we'll be hearing, it does link very, very well with uh, aspects of some late Schubert in particular. Um, I'm far from suggesting that Schubert's music in any way is a representation of this painting. He, he, he can't have known it. He certainly didn't know Friedrich. Uh, but on the other hand, had he chosen a painter to illustrate his music, Caspar David Friedrich would have been the, the key person to do it. Well, let's just think about the, this picture in a, in a little detail. It is a, it's a fantastically gothic, gloomy image. There is a, 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 a man who's discarded his crutches, very small, next to a rock which is much bigger than him. He's praying at a crucifix, and out of the snow all around him, very kind of thick, very almost where you can touch the, the snow, even as we're looking at the painting here, which is actually quite small, in the background, behind it, through the mist, looms a Gothic cathedral. I mean, there's loneliness, visionary, there's the, the, the religious man's relationship with nature, man's relationship with God. Indeed. All of that's here Indeed. in an outdoor scene. And most particularly, there's a, a temporal aspect of this painting. Uh, Schumann, one of Schubert's greatest admirers, said in 1833 that a composer has as much to learn from a Raphael Madonna as does uh, a painter from a Mozart symphony. And one of the things that I find interesting about this painting is its musicality. We are, we are seeing the, probably the end stage of this journey. There are footsteps if we read the painting from right to left. You, there are, as you say, the abandoned crutches. Not abandoned together. No, one very much. One sure. much further in than the other. And then the journey has stopped in front of this crucifix. But behind there's the hazy church, which maybe suggests the end of the journey in redemption in some eternity that we can't know about. Uh, at the very f in the very foreground, there are mm. tiny, tiny green blades of grass coming up, which again maybe suggests new hope. So and the, the green of almost the, the kind of architectural pine trees in, in which the crucifix is situated. They pick up the church. They pick up the spires of the church. So uh, what I want to stress is that, as I say, even in looking at this painting, and it's a small painting, as we all noticed when we came in, we actually have to take time over it. It, it, it embeds us in time in a way that a piece of music does. And Schubert in particular? Well, Schubert in particular, except that uh, in many cases it seems as though Schubert does the reverse. Schubert's music has often been compared to landscape. Uh, Sir George Grove, whom you'll be talking about later in the, uh, the, the Spirit of Schubert programs, I believe, uh, writing the first article about Schubert in his Grove Dictionary in 1890, said that uh, the way Schubert's music changes in the songs, together with the words, is like the, the passing of sun or, or cloud over a landscape. And 30 years after that, Theodor Adorno wrote a wonderful essay about listening to Schubert in which the, the metaphor of landscape is absolutely central. So a movement that I would compare this painting to is the slow movement of the late piano sonata Deutsch 960. His very last one, B-flat major. That's one. right, that's right. Um, there's a similarity in, in, in the, the, the bleak key of C-sharp minor that, uh, that Schubert chose for that movement. But what's so different is that there we just seem to be placed in a landscape. We're not being taken on a journey, even a journey like this one. We're simply placed in a landscape and the landscape changes incrementally around us without our seeming to go anywhere. You can't, one could draw a comparison. We can draw a comparison with, with the painting in the sense that the small figure who's huddled behind that rock, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's as if, in other words, we, we are inhabiting suddenly that figure. We've come out of whatever the different landscape is of the first movement, oh. and suddenly we're in the experience of that body surrounded by that yes. nature. Uh, maybe the other thing, the other, perhaps another connection between this experience of Schubert's music, that movement in particular in landscape, is the sense that we are small relative to what's happening around us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and we are, you know, we change, we sense change in our own bodies in a way that we can't so easily sense change in a landscape, except for those passing moments of illumination or darkening. And Schubert catches that particularly well at two points in the, the, the slow movement of Deutsch 960, where uh, he moves, to, to get a little bit technical, he, 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 he arrives at a triad, he holds one note of it and changes mm -hmm. the other two by the smallest interval he can, a semitone. 
Uh, so the pianist's hands hardly need to move at all, but the effect is absolutely transformative, and it's exactly like Grove says. It's, it's like the sun coming up from behind a cloud. Perhaps the, the, this the, this huddled figure in the in the in the winter land the winter landscape of, of David Friedrich looking at the cross and then suddenly realizing the Gothic cathedral is rearing up beside him something like that maybe so one, or, one, or one turn of the head that produces a complete yes, change of yes outlook. yes exactly another aspect though of those those three chords that Schubert combines in in that sonata movement is that they're all equally spaced from one another and Adorno in his essay. Uh, talking about landscape, as I said, talks particularly about the landscape of death, about the way that um, all points can be equidistant from a centre. And if one simply traversed through this cycle of Schubert's chords, one, one wouldn't go anywhere, would simply, simply okay. be cir circling around the same point. So it would be a static motion and therefore a sort of life, but also a well, kind a, of death a movement, as well. A movement, but a movement that always brings you back to the same place. And who's to say how many times this wanderer has, has walked around those fir trees until finally he decides he can, he can go no further. So Adorno's notion of the landscape of death brings us back uh, very much to what we're seeing in this in this painting. Nicholas, you're suggesting really there's a, a, a kind of a really profound transformation that's happening here because Schubert takes might take an idea from nature, whether it be loneliness, whether it be a flower, whether it be a trout, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and transforms it into a kind of non-exact shimmering metaphor. But that experience, when he gives it to us as music, itself becomes a sort of different kind of landscape, which is neither totally natural, but neither also perhaps just entirely musical. It's something in between. Exactly, exactly. We, we, we mustn't fall into the trap, as I said, of assuming that he's, you know, he's got a code whereby B-flat equals oak trees or, or whatever it might be. On the other hand, he was able to use conventional uh, figures, as it were. I mean, take, take the example of the horn call, uh, the song Die Post from Winterreise. The, the, the poem tells us at the start that the poet hears a, a post horn in the street, and Schubert's music captures that with its triadic figures. The dotted figures clearly are the horse, the postman's horse. So here we hear the, the noises of the street coming into the interior. Another real horn call, the start of the great C major symphony, um, which solo Schubert, horn. Schubert solo horn, which Schubert started uh, in Gmunden, in the the area of the Salzkammergut that he loved. Uh, that is the sound of, well, you can imagine the sound of a horn sounding across the Traumsee, which he which he adored, and uh, even down to the, the the little dying echo at the end of the the call at the beginning of the symphony. Nicholas Marston, Caspar David Friedrich uh, Schubert. I feel that we're all, you know, we can all go on wandering journeys through this little painting, but mostly through these landscapes of, of Schubert's music. Thank you very much, Nicholas Marston, National Gallery. Great pleasure.